Article 4 contains Senate files that heavily focused on health insurance. The bills included that uh, either mandate coverage or uh, mandate a payment level for a particular benefit are Senate files 3511, 2459, 4423, 3967, Senate file 3351, 3926, and 2209. There are a handful of other incorporated bills as well. Uh, those bills govern the practice of insurance or transactions within the insurance industry. Those include Senate file 3543, 4837, and 3531. With respect to the various modifications identified in the bill index for this article, Senate file 3511 was modified to remove certain types of mandatory coverage relating to maternity care. 2459 had its requirements made inapplicable to the public programs. Senate file 4423 had its cap on benefit amount for the public programs removed. That was done to comply with federal law. Senate file 3967 was modified to permit plans to impose cost sharing on enrollees. 4837 was changed simply to clarify an ambiguity pertaining to the Attorney General's review process. Uh, Senate file 3531 had a grant removed and 3351 had technical changes made. Article 5 includes those bill items which carry a fiscal cost and that primarily affect the Department of Health. The only underlying bill that was modified in this article was Senate file 3134 on natural organic reduction. Uh, that bill had new language added to insert testing and other reduction standards. Other bills in this article are Senate files 4074, 4101, 4235, and 1303, as well as two sections from the governor's budget on the health professional education loan forgiveness program. Article 6 relates to provisions affecting MDH regulatory authority, but without a cost. This includes Senate Files 4861, 2508, 3674, SF 3819-2608, uh, 4010. It also includes MDH's Policy and Vital Records Bill, as well as several sections from the Health Care Article and the Governor's Budget Bill. The only modification in this article is to a provision in the governor's bill which was modified to retain quarterly reporting by MDH to the legislature of certain interagency agreements, but to also remove a requirement for the department to further provide a copy of the interagency agreement. Article 7 uh, relates to emergency medical services and includes language from Senate File 4835 and Senate File 4697. The modifications that were made to Senate File 4835 are just some minor changes to the reporting requirements of the office. The modifications made to Senate File 4697 includes modifying the definition of ambulance services personnel and now includes certified flight registered nurses or certified emergency nurse and it allows them to serve on advanced life support ambulances. It's also been modified to require registered nurses who are drivers to have completed a certified emergency vehicle operators program. And finally, it was modified to allow ba alternative basic life support staffing variances to alternative basic life support staffing, uh, and then variances to advanced life support staffing in the entire state, not just in rural, rural areas. Article 8 relates to the practice of pharmacy uh, and the regulatory authority of the Board of Pharmacy. Uh, there were no bills that were modified in this article and its underlying bills are Senate Files 2320, 1176, 3726, SF 3727, 2266, 4584, and 3460. Article 9 contains provisions related to behavioral health. It includes provisions from Senate File 4664, Senate File 1615, 3552, uh, some from Laws 2023, Chapter 70, which was passed last session, 
and Senate File 5084. It also includes two new provisions, uh, one that expands medical assistance coverage for skills training related to family psychoeducational services, and another that directs the Commissioner of Human Services to develop medical assistance benefits for various services related to mental health. Article 10 contains provisions related to child protection and welfare. It contains language from Senate File 4877, Senate File 3614, Senate File 5385, 4761, 3820, and 1639. Um, the only change really noted is in Senate File 4761. It was also amended in state government committee uh, to more conform with how they like to see councils drafted in statute. Article 11 includes uh, bills that related to economic supports, which are Senate File 4402, Senate File 4185, and Senate File 4402 was amended also in higher education to again make conforming changes related to things outside this committee's jurisdiction. There's also new language, sort of, from Senate File 4185 that allows the programs, the food bank program and the SNAP for college students to transfer to the new Department of Children, Youth and Families and to let the commissioners and legislative committees know when that happens. Article 12 deals with housing and homelessness. It contains provisions from Senate File 5032, which requires the Commissioner of Human Services to contract with the Wilder Foundation for a study on the statewide numbers of pregnant and parenting homeless youth. And it also contains provisions from the Governor's Budget Bill 5385 um, reinstating a subdivision that was mistakenly appealed, la repealed last year in the revisor's bill. Article 13 is child care licensing. Contains one provision and it directs the D Commissioner of Children, Youth and Families to develop and implement a child care weighted risk system for child care licensing and also repeals the section allowing the Commissioner to issue a fix it ticket. This is part of the Governor's budget bill. Article 14 is provisions that are related to the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. This entire article is also contained in the Governor's Budget Bill, and it contains various provisions that establish an intergovernmental advisory committee, um, provides that child foster care residents setting stay at the Department of Human Services, um, and it provides for the effective date of certain transfers of responsibilities and adds additional transfers. Article 15 contains modifications to the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act that were contained in Senate File 4480. Um, this bill, after it left our committee, was further amended in judiciary to remove um, agree non-agreed upon language and also make other technical and conforming changes. Article 16 um, creates the Minnesota African American Family Preservation and Child Welfare Disproportionality Act. This is contained in Senate File 716. This was also amended in judiciary um, to just make some other technical and conforming changes. Article 17 is the Children and Families Policy Article. It contains uh, provisions from Senate File 4572 which is a Department of Human Services policy bill from their Children and Family Services Division. It also contains provisions from Senate File 610 and Senate File 3615, which were both amended in Health and Human Services but laid over, so no further changes were made. Article 18 is the Department of Human Services policy. This contains provisions from Senate File 4665, which was the Department of Human Services Office of Inspector General Policy Bill. It also contains provisions from Senate File 4618, which is, again, the DHS Office of Inspector General Children's Licensing Policy Bill, and also contains provisions from Senate File 4448, which was the Department of Human Services Housing and Mental Health Services Policy Bill. And then Article 19 is the last article, uh, and it contains miscellaneous provisions. Uh, section, it, contain, it requires the Commissioners of Health, Human Services, and Children, Youth, and Families to consult with the MMB Evaluation Unit to determine performance measures for their grant programs. 
It also contains provisions relating to establishing a limit on copying fees for patient record, record requests. Additionally, it provides that certain sections of the Minnesota Health Records Act should be construed as more stringent than the HIPAA security and privacy rules from Senate File 4199. And additionally, it contains language from Senate File 4524, 4864, and then a few other technical changes that uh, staff may, uh, caught from last session. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wonderful, thank you very, very much. Uh, we do have an A2, uh, that is the big, that's the one, okay, uh, that we want to adopt to get the bill in its proper form so that we can go ahead and start talking about other amendments. Any questions on that amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A2 is adopted. Um, did you have anything to say before we went on to other amendments, Madam Chair? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, we do have, we have a couple um, other things that are up, other amendments that are sort of technical. I mean, uh, one thing is we, um, Allie got to 19 and I thought, gosh, we should have gotten to 20. And, and here we have the A35 amendment so we can get to Article 20. Um, and that's the appropriations article that um, was completed today. So I, I don't know if we want to adopt that um, next. Um, if I don't know if Senate Council can describe that or Mr. Albrecht. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what to say about it other than it's the the. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair. And Senator Wicklin, it's the A35 amendment. Um, and uh, the, on page one is the forecast adjustment article, um, which is just what it says. And then the appropriations article begins on page two, on line 2.11, and continues. So basically, this is everything that was on the spreadsheet and the dollar amounts that go with it, and any necessary riders to enact the provisions on the spreadsheet. And then <clears throat> there are a number of law changes that begin on page 18, on line 18.30. Um, again, those were all talked about when I went through the spreadsheet. Um, if anyone has any questions about any of them, I'd be happy to answer them, but I think I will bore you I will not bore you with 30 pages of sort of relatively technical uh, changes. Thank you, Mr. Albrecht. Senator Uckey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And when we approved the uh, A2 amendment, uh, this for uh, Senator Wicklund, the bill that was the bill that now came, we replaced with the delete all, had the language in it for MAVA. Did that get put in somewhere else, or was that in a bill earlier for that correction from last year? Senator Wicklin. I think Mr. Albert can answer that question. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Wicklin and Senator Utke, that is the base bill, and it is on page 43 of the A35 amendment. Senator Thank you, Madam Chair. Perfect. I hadn't gotten that far. I went through everything else and I wasn't <laughs> finding it, but I just want to make sure because it got missed last year. We had it, I think, on the spreadsheet, but not in the bill or however it worked out, but we're going to get them covered this year, so thank you. Madam Chair, Senator Uckley, I actually came close to getting missed this year, too. We tracked it down. <laughs> Senator Abler. Well, thanks. Just one question. I'll save my comments for later. Uh, online 19.25 uh, and following with the premium security transfer out. Uh, Mr. Albrecht, do you know how much is left in there or is that the entirety of the uh, premium security account? Mr. Albrecht. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Abler, it would leave the balance at the end of fiscal year 2027 at zero. Thank you. Senator Abler? It's a bad idea, but thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, on the A35, 
All those in favor of adopting the A35 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And then um, I have an amendment, the A40 amendment that was passed out um, this evening. And that has a number of, um, well, some of the items are technical items purely. Some are uh, modifications to bills that are in, in the bill um, but had um, changes that needed to be uh, made to them. And they're, we kind of brought them all together in this amendment. And I believe Senate Council is going to go through, they have an annotated copy so they can go through it with us and, and point out what each um, section does. Senate Council. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'd be happy to walk through this A40 amendment. Uh, if you turn to the first item on line 1.3, that is purely technical. On line 1.4, uh, this next provision extends for uh, quite a bit. This section 9, I think it extends for over three pages. This represents uh, additional guidance provided by the Department of Human Services uh, and stakeholders to benefit pharmacies and customers both with clear language um, on these payment rates. That uh, relates to Senate File 4330. So I believe that brings us to um, line 4.18. These provisions relate to the Medical Debt Fairness Act. Uh, the goal of these edits, which also extend for a little bit of time, were simply to match up with language that was passed in the Judiciary Committee to make sure that we captured all of uh, the changes that were made therein. Moving to line 5.2, you'll see uh, at the top of that page, it says page 73, delete section, uh, subdivision two. This is, um, this moves the definition of the term gender affirming care from chapter 256B, which that's the medical assistance program chapter, to 62Q. Uh, there is no substantive effect of this, um, as medical assistance already covers uh, gender-affirming care. Um, it's, it's more appropriate to put in Chapter 62Q so that it clearly relates to the managed care organizations. Uh, the next item would be on line 5.25. This reflects updated uh, Department of Health guidance on permit conditions. That change extends all the way through page six and takes us to page section seven. Uh, members, Madam, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, line 7.2 to 11.10 are from the governor's budget bill and they just make modifications related to the supplemental nursing services agencies. Yeah. Um, line 11.11 .11 updates the effective date for the 988 crisis line. And then lines 11.12 through 11.26 makes modifications to the assertive community treatment um, sections that are currently in the A2 amendment and its stakeholder edits and agreed upon language. If you uh, turn to line 11.27, there's language in the bill that directs the commissioner to increase uh, rates for certain mental health providers. Uh, lines 11.27 to 11.29 specifies the amount of money that may be used for those purposes. Uh, lines 11.30 through 12.15 um, direct the commissioner while they are developing the new SSIS system for child welfare. Um, it just gives them some parameters and things that they need to include while doing so. Lines 12.16 through 12.31 modifies the informal kinship proposal that is currently in the bill, and it's just additionally some more agreed upon language uh, through stakeholders. 
Uh, line 12.32 is merely a technical change that came from uh, staff duplicating sections. Lines 13.1 to 16.2 removes the transfer of OREC to the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Just flip. Line 16.3 to 16.6 makes changes to the Department of Children, Youth, and Families transfers, and these were recommended from the uh, Minnesota Management and Budget and the Transition Office. Line 16.7 is again removing the transfer of OREC to the new department. Then line 16.8 to 27.16 makes modifications to the Minnesota African American Family Preservation and Child Welfare Child Welfare Disproportionality Act. Um, it adds effective dates that delay the effective date of the act uh, by two years, except as it relates to a pilot program that would be operating in both Hennepin and Ramsey County. It also makes some changes through to the duty to prevent out of home placement. Um, let's see. Non-custodial parents and temporary out-of-home placement, ensuring frequent visitation, um, and it also requires cultural competency training for individuals working with African American and disproportionately represented children in the child welfare system, and it also codifies already existing uh, the already existing African American Child Wellbeing Advisory Council and the African American Child Wellbeing Unit that are both currently operating within the Department of Human Services. Just puts them into statute. And then Madam it, Chair. sorry, go ahead. Oh, Senator. Just a question about that. why we're delaying the act. I was hoping we could move it along, but it's being delayed except for two pilots. Can we, just, we're almost done, and then we can answer those questions. Oh, okay, sure. And then it also just makes some additional technical changes as Staff was updating, updating line numbers. Um, other than that, I think that's pretty much it for that. Um, lines 27.17 and 27.20 are just technical changes caught by staff. And then the rest from 27.22 through the end of the bill. <laughs> I guess I can probably wrap up the rest of this. Uh, so starting at line 27.22 relates to the University of Minnesota Task Force recommendations on academic health. It inserts a uh, language regarding a request for information into the provisions that relates to Senate file 4912. And that takes us to the end. Thank you. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. I'll just add, um, with respect to that last um, section, the RFI request for information section, that comes about from work that um, Representative Liebling was doing on language. Um, this was one of the task force recommendations to have an evaluation of statewide health care needs and looking at capacity um, for health care infrastructure across the state. And so since she had this language developed, um, I wanted to add it to the bill and the, the areas that had to do with uh, the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Senator Abler, questions to the A40. Well, thanks, so since you're just on that last one there, uh, that sounds kind of like a very shrunk down version of Senator Murphy's you know, task force thing. Um, so, who on earth is going to figure out all this stuff? I, it, it seems like a really nice thing, but this is, I mean, what's the, is there money for this? I mean, this is a topic that, Senator Mann, you realize this could be a very large topic. Um, so what's the expectation for it besides it sounds nice to try to ask those questions? Senator Wicklund. Mm -hmm. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, there is, yes, there is money on the spreadsheet for this, along with the other um, health care workforce council report that I had included in my bill. Um, I think this this is not meant to be um, the, the type of uh, forum that Senator Murphy's bill intends to be sort of an ongoing, I think, ongoing 
mission to talk about health care access and what are the issues getting in the way of, of um, accessing health care. This was more to um, come up with kind of where are things at today and how do we um, look at things like um, capacity by geography, um, how to consider, you know, where different expertise is located and how could we um, do a better job of collaborating. Um, if, there, if there are areas of expertise, can um, different health systems share the information or share these opportunities rather than each building out the same type of expertise uh, and th things like that. So it was more of a, a moment in time and then looking how do we use that information to tell us how to move forward better. But it has more to do with the healthcare system and infrastructure than, than maybe what um, Senator Murphy's bill would have. Right. Senator I'm, not, sure. I'm, not, I'm not trying to believe or anything, but this actually, this is a, it's an RFI to decide how to go ask people more questions. So, I mean, I, I just hope it's productive. If I, mm -hmm. I, those are the kind of questions we ask ourselves here as policymakers and so whatever. Um, the question I had originally just was why are we delaying uh, African-American, whatever, the child protection proposal? I was kind of hoping we'd get going on that. Uh, I was really happy it's in the bill. I, if you know, we talked about it. We had broad agreement that we should do it. Um, if you delay it two years, that means it's going to be three years before it gets going. And uh, I just saw it as kind of an urgency, and it's finally going to be got across the finish line. So does let me know why it's delayed. I Senator just think Wood. that's a bad idea. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, the, the delay is part of the uh, coming up with a method to implement this that we could, or that the author um, could see had um, more chance of being supported by all the entities that have to be involved. And we know that it's, you know, not only DHS that's going to be having to do a lot of work, but the counties, you know, it will be um, having them do a lot more work. And it was felt that to, imp to say that implementation was going to happen right away, that that would not be feasible for the counties to, to do that right away. So this is meant to, and then also um, being a supplemental budget, we don't, there's not the opportunity to create the budget that maybe is needed to do a full implementation right away. So this is a method to give some um, lead time and get things started and get, and absolutely get things moving but, you know, being that it is not the budget year, it's harder to, yeah, it. to say we're just going to go forward fully. Well, thanks, Senator Madam Chair. I just see this is actually one of the highlights of the bill from my point of view in terms of something that's going to change a whole sector of outcomes. So anyway, I just hope they can be successful. Mm -hmm. And if they can speed it up, I just hope so. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Other questions on the A40? Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, my question is uh, on page, starts on page 13, when it, uh, that's where we start to move the ORAC um, language over to the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Why are we doing that? Um, Senator Wigland. Madam Chair, Senator Utke, this actually is, is repeal or removing that um, transition. It was not the intention of the department of the new department to move this all over. I'm not sure how the language got included in the first place, but this was not. Yeah, so it's it's actually saying that it's not going to be transferred, with the exception of there. I think there was a reference to um, a unit that needs to interface with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Senator Rucky. and I don't know if. if Ms. Hoffman, let you can maybe speak more directly to it than I can. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Rucky, members, uh, that's accurate. The current bill language transfers OREC to the new department, and the language in the A40 amendment re like removes it from the bill to transfer and keeps it at the Department of Human Services. It, oh. Senator yeah. Rucky. Okay, uh, thank you, because I'm looking at, you know, even 14 and 15 where I see human services crossed out and without 
taking in all the language, but human services crossed out and children, youth and families. So it, that's why it looked like it was moving. Ms. Hoffman. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Aki, it does keep any appropriations that are necessary um, to tribal social service agencies or things related to things that are transferring to the new department. It's just that one paragraph D on page 15 and then on page 14, the paragraph M. Everything else is staying with the Department of Human Services. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Other questions on the A40? Senator Hoffman. To that point, um, Senator Wickland, what you and I had talked about, and I had sent some specific uh, sections in this previous bill, those, those, uh, those marked sections were, were included in this uh, amendment. Is that correct? Senator Hoffman, who are you asking that question uh, to? Both the Senator Wickland and to Ms. Hoffman. Ms. Hoffman. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. So th thank you, Senator Wickland, for, for hearing that. It came from the other body uh, yesterday. It was a surprise. It was a surprise that this stuff was in there, and uh, I would just would have been really important if those of us, including uh, Representative Baker, Representative Neuer, myself, and, and others would have been, I don't know, aware that maybe this was something that was coming, and I appreciate you flagging that and uh, stopping. This is bad policy, and it, I'm glad you made it better policy. Thank you. Okay, the motion is to adopt the A40. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed, the A40 is amended, uh, adopted. Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think, are there any others that um, council thinks are the technical, oh, is the, the A24? A24, is that one that, okay. Is it in our packets? It should be in your packets. Madam Chair. Members, it is the A24-0308. I'm not sure if there's another A24, so. Towards the top of the pile. I'd like to move then the A24-0308. If um, Ms. Hoffman lets you can uh, talk through that one. Ms. Hoffman. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, this is purely technical. Um, these are provisions that are currently included in the DE that were pulled by the revisor's office as being affected by the DCYF recodification that was passed and enacted earlier this session. So this is literally just taking those sections and saying, as amended by laws 2024, chapter 80, yada, yada, yada. Um, it is the same changes are being made as what's currently in the DE. Nothing substantive is happening at all. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Members, question on the A24. Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A24 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the A24 is adopted. Looks. Senator Wicklin, um, did you want to do the A39? Um, yeah, is that, um, I guess, uh, Madam Chair, Senate Council is the one that um, was also a DCYF related um, and it was negotiated with the, um, the union MAPE. Um, it has to do with um, OIG hearings and the location, and I'm not sure which number that is. The A39? Is it? Okay. I, I couldn't hear the, so the, I'd like to move the A39. Senator Rickle moves the A39. Um, did you want to talk about it or did? If uh, Ms. Hoffman, Hoffman lets you can speak to that one. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, this amendment, um, current, in the recodification bill, Staff, nonpartisan staff, moved and copied 
um, provisions that were related to appeals hearings, um, copy the duties of current human services judges who hear child maltreatment determination appeals um, and other things along that matter. And discussing with the union MAPE and the transition team, it was advised that it actually stay within the Department of Human Services and just expand very little what to include the new duties of the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Questions on the 839? See, seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the 839, say so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the 839 is adopted. Members, amendments, or do you want me to just go down the list? All right, we're going to start with the A. Do we have a copy of the A3? A3. I'm so glad, Madam Chair, that you went down the list. We'll let the A3 move itself uh, around the table. So the A3, I'd like to move the A3 amendment. Senator Hoffman moves the A3. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. It was originally Senator Bolden's bill, Senate file 4449. The Diaper Bank of Minnesota received $1.1 million in state grant over the biennium to uh, more robustly uh, address diaper need um, in the state of Minnesota. The state funding allows Diaper Bank of Minnesota to increase the distribution up 250% up to 2.5 million diapers per year into an expanded statewide geographic area. There's operational expenses to build the infrastructure necessary to scale to that level of, of distribution. The funding bill as originally drafted allowed grant funds to be used for the operational expenses. The bill version that passed removed this language and instead offered 4%, um, which what we really want to is um, increase the restrictions from 4% to 10% for allowable administrative expenses and that provides the flexibility that's needed to cover the true cost of distributing 2.5 million diapers statewide. Uh, the original bill was a bipartisan support with uh, Senators Bolden, myself, McQuaid, Duckworth, and Coleman as co-authors. So I would uh, appreciate uh, everybody. It's a good amendment. Please vote yes. Senator Wicklund. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman, thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, it was brought to my attention as well, and I support the amendment. Members, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A3? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? The A3 is adopted. Senator Hoffman, I enjoyed that so much. I want you to keep going. How about the A7? The A7, all right. Well, I thought maybe we'd go, like, since we're doing, you know, this is a, a shout-out to people who are tracking a bingo card. Um, there's a, an album, 1989, out there, and there's one person in this room knows what I'm referring to, and I won't say that, Matt Freeman. The A7 Amendment members, um, it's the parental rights for those with disabilities provision, so I move the A7. Senator Hoffman moves the A7. Senator Hoffman, anything else on that one? Thousands of parents with disabilities are successfully raising children all over the country. Right here in Minnesota, there are many, in fact. Um, that piece... Um, there's some fear and misconceptions about disability. Parents with disabilities experience the disproportionately high rates of child removal or loss of parental rights. The National Federation of the Blind Minnesota brought this bill to us because of their direct experience in, in which parents, parents' rights have been questioned on the basis of blindness. Yeah, questioned on the basis of blindness. We know this happens uh, with other disabilities as well. This legislation does not require new services or additional funding. Rather, it sets a framework or procedure. I can go into line by line if you want, but we've heard this bill, and I think it's a great bill, and thank you for your support on that. Vote yes. Members. Senator Wickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, um, it does seem like uh, good language. Um, is this something, have you um, worked with the department on this language? I guess I... But Senator I, I don't have any objection to it. No, yeah, along the way for, yes, it's been Madam Chair and, and Senator Wicklund, it's been vetted beyond, and yes, um, yes and yes. Okay. I, would, I would be supportive of adding this to the bill. Members' questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A3 
seven. Signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The A7 is adopted. Thank Senator you. Hoffman, how about the A14? I love that. I, I tried to get an A19 so we could like quote a Steely Dan song uh, as long as we're looking at the Hartford Whalers over there. But the A, a I move the A14 amendment, please. Senator Hoffman was the A14. Go for it. This is establishing coverage on the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation colonization as an outpatient service, Dr. Chair. The mobile ECMO program started at the University of Minnesota, um, and the goal was to provide earlier uh, cantillation and placement of ECMO and out of hospital cardiac arrest patients. Uh, this is um, overall patient care has been detrimental because it's been a complicated process within the hospital systems to get reimbursement for the procedure. And so, what have we've shown is a mobile truck that has been shown to be successful in a viable way to decrease time to cantillation and therefore survival from the sudden cardiac arrests. But there's no way to bill these services as inpatient. To sustain the program, ensuring a way to bill services for HCMO is critical, and this is what this does. This amendment um, is an adaption of a bill that we heard, Senate File 3229, and would instruct the department to use the next year to determine the feasibility of an outpatient reimbursement mechanism. So we need to find that avenue for billing those outpatient services. I think this is prudent and well to the point. And thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Wickland. Senator Wickland. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman. This is, I think, um, I think this is a really good idea to have this work done by the department to figure this out. Um, I didn't know much about it, but um, when I was presenting my bill in the Higher Education Committee, there was a testifier from the University of Minnesota who was talking about this um, innovation, this innovative work that they're doing to develop this to. Um, address, uh, better address heart attacks and better address what could be done in CPR than CPR. And there was a New York Times um, magazine article from early in April that was quite a long story about it. And it was really very interesting. So anyway, I'm, I'm glad to see this move forward. So I support the amendment. Thank you. Members, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A14 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A14 is adopted. Who wants to go next? Nobody? <coughs> Senator Kupek. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will, uh, I'll switch to this one. Let's, uh, I offer the uh, A28 amendment. Go ahead. Okay, the uh, A28 amendment, this is from uh, Senator Seberger's bill that con uh, is concerned with the EMS program. Uh, it is a small change to address some concerns from some physicians, uh, and it also will kind of line it up with the bill uh, over in the other body. So it's a, it's a pretty simple bill, deletes a couple of lines here, and then uh, also just adds a few words. Senator Wickland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and this was brought to my attention, and I would support um, making the changes that Senator Seberger has brought forward. So, Members' you. questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A28 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A28 is adopted. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. I'll just do a couple easy ones. There's some more things to discuss later, but I'd like to move the A8. All right, we're gonna let him finish, but we'll we can go with the A8. What's that? Se Senator Kupak had one more. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I thought he was done. I'll let my neighbor go. I I, I apologize. I thought he. Had, there's just more good work to be done. Now. There is more Thank good you. work. Yeah, I'll yield. Senator Kupak, and you're part of this good work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I have the A27 amendment. A27. Go ahead. Okay, uh, the A27 amendment is uh, really a reincarnation of Senate File 4382, which we did here in this committee, also uh, known in the shorthand as the hospital closure bill. Um, so it is that bill, uh, but with a few changes made to it. So I'll run through those changes if that's okay. Uh, the first part is um, adding some language uh, to, about the, uh, not the closure amount. We changed it in committee to make it 182 days. Uh, we're also gonna add some uh, language to allow the commissioner 
uh, to make some, uh, if they think that the 182 days is not feasible, that they could shorten it up. So that makes a, a little bit of changes there. Uh, we also uh, went and changed uh, the distance. We had a set distance of 10 miles. Um, and so we'll keep the 10 miles, but also add the word as practicable, practicable just in case, um, you know, there's a nice big venue 11 miles away, maybe to hold a meeting. Uh, we would not want to preclude that from being a meeting place. Uh, the other section on line 2.28, um, we did, uh, we had originally that they had to notify statewide media. Uh, and we took out the word statewide media that uh, just didn't seem practical at the moment uh, to actually do that. And I'm sure anything that got through the media will probably get picked up statewide if there was a hospital uh, to be closed. And then the uh, last section has to do with the uh, fines uh, for violating any of the, the things in this section. Uh, we did put a cap on the amount of fines uh, on that. So those are the uh, changes that we made, and this was kind of in conjunction uh, with both stakeholders uh, involved with this bill. Senator Wigland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I talked with Senator Kupik about this, and I appreciate that he's gone and worked with um, all the stakeholders on this, and I, I appreciate him bringing forward this, this comp other uh, modified language, and I'd like to see it included in the bill. Members' questions? Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess this probably for Senator Kupek, but we're, we're kind of back to some of the same stuff we had before. And I just wonder what we're trying to really accomplish. Um, they're not going to close because they want to. Um, and when I look at a half a year in time or the, you know, those type of fines, they're pushing right to the last minute, and when they finally see there is no other option, that's what happens. And um, I don't know that a six-month lead time is possible. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit more of what went into this? Because I don't know that it's moving in the right direction. Senator Kubek. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Utke. The, the overall uh, idea is to make sure that communities have a voice and a say uh, when one of these, play, when a hospital is closing uh, or you know discontinuing services. So uh, that's why there's a lot of things laid out here and things to do. And actually, uh, you know, talking to the hospitals, they're okay with that list of things to do. Uh, and I think the the realization. We're talking with other people about the 182 days is that, yes, there may be a case where 182 days doesn't work. That's why we're going to give the, the department a little bit of latitude that if the hospitals come and say, look, you know, everybody's leaving. We can't do 182 days. This will give them the ability for the department to make an assessment and say that is, is not uh, the way to go. We know um, that in some cases in the past where there have been some fines in place, that, that some hospitals have just, the fines have been so small that they have just ignored those fines and done that. So I think putting a little bit more teeth into it uh, may help make sure that everybody checks off all these boxes that we'd like them to check off and so that communities are part of the conversation if one of these facilities is closing. Senator Rucky. Other questions? Seeing none, uh, the motion to adopt the A27. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Abler. Thank you. I'll just do a couple of little ones here. Um, so I'd like to move the A8. The A8. And by the way, the, uh, the need brought forward by my good uh, colleague to my, to my right. Is that really where you land? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, is something very necessary, and I have an amendment discussing a similar thing later. But the A8 is... Um, Something that came to me, there's, uh, and this has been worked out with the department, and there's been some technical work done to make it even better. But the problem is, when we did the uh, background, the duplicated background studies, the, the board and the department had some cross wires about who was in charge. And the, the, the department wound up uh, disqualifying some nurses who had done something like a year ago that the board should well have taken up. They weren't emergent. Um, and it created a lot of trouble for some of these nurses. There were four or five, and if I don't have the stories in front of me, but they were quite compelling. It's like, seriously, you're going to pull their plug for that. And so um, the department did not intend that. 
And so this clarifies that the department could have some oversight if there was something critical, like there was gross maltreatment or whatever, but that ordinarily works, this work would go back to the board for the normal disciplinary process. Senator Wicklund. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Abler, so this is language you have, I wasn't sure you said you had worked with the department and this is worked out or it still it was, needs it to be It was worked more? out and then buff and shine. Okay. Just lately. <laughs> okay, so. so they, they, this, they agree with this language. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, that seems reasonable and um, I would accept it as. Members, questions? Seeing none, on adopting the AA, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A8 is adopted. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And this one's even shorter. I move the A9. And yeah. it's not the end of the world, but uh, when we were going through the governor's bill, uh, we were talking about a place um, that's um, going to be, uh, that's, that's been terminated. They've been shut down. And uh, this is on line 162.15. There's about six lines there. Um, and so they, as a licensee, they've had their thing denied. And we were chatting, um, the, the current law that's in there says they have to submit a closure plan uh, within 10 days of receipt of the reconsideration decision. And the discussion that we had in the committee that was led by me, I guess, but was like, you've been hoping to get reconsidered for your license thing and all your work's gone to the reports and hope it comes. Um, and so now it didn't work. And this would just give, um, this, this would say you have to submit a draft plan within 10 days and then a final plan within 30 days just so we could kind of soft land it. Um, I, hope, I think the department would find this friendly. I, I didn't actually ask them, but I, I think it's something simple enough. So if they want to talk about it, they can. But Senator Wickland? Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know if there is anyone here from, anyone the, from the department that want, around that want to comment on it. Um, I see no one jumping up. There's no one okay. from the department. Come on, we got like an army of people there somewhere. It does. I mean, it seems like this would be, as you say, you know, if, if, if they've gone through the whole process and this is what they've gotten to, that having to submit the whole plan we, in we 10 days. We got someone. Okay. Yeah, Lisa's coming up here. Hi. Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Lisa Tiemann, Director of Government Relations at MDH. So yeah, based on this amendment, um, Senator Abler, we do think um, it would still need to be clear that between this 30-day extension, they still need to be uh, working on the plan and working with us because we don't want to use this as a mechanism to keep drawing out the process. But as long as the 30 days is really intended to wrap that up, we don't see an issue with that. Uh, Madam Chair, this will, we could work out just something to clarify. It's not meant to do anything except just be reasonable with it. Because in talking with, I don't forget the name, the staffer's name, and they were intending to work with them. So, yep. all right, thank you. So I'll, I'll clean it up a little bit if we can adopt it. Okay. Madam Chair. Thank you. Thanks. Questions on the A9? <laughs> Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of the A9 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A9 is adopted. And just the last one for the Senator moment, Madam Chair. I'll move the A10. The A10. Go ahead. So this talks about, I think the House says something similar to this, where they're trying to work on this background studies. We've made 16 efforts to Sunday and try to find ways to make background studies work. Um, and frankly, it's not working. And hospitals and home care providers and everybody in child care just struggle with finding a place to have it done. Um, and so I was talking to Senator Latz, I believe, about this, and that's where we kind of thought of the idea. But um, that is it possible that the DHS could become a vendor and either use the other vendor and part it out? And so that's the discussion of this. Um, so that's what the and, and so they would it would ask them to. Actually, wait, just ask them to consider the feasibility. So if it's not feasible, then don't do it. But that's my request. Would they sure. please think about it and let us know if it's possible. So. Is there someone from DHS that can come <coughs> speak to it? Did you have any thoughts in the meantime? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I mean, I, I do think that over time, it, it has been over a number of years an issue. We seem to get 
um, something set up and then vendors change and, and it has caused different um, different issues as far as people having access to vendor or vendors close by and so um, I'm open to the idea if you have um, if DHS has more comments. Madam Chair Ari Didian, uh, Acting Ledge Director at DHS OIG. Uh, we uh, we don't have any concerns about this language. Actually, we worked with the other body on something similar for the human services omnibus. Um, I, this is written a little bit differently, but I will say that uh, this would add probably, and I, again, we haven't fiscal noted this particular language, but it would probably add pretty significant costs to the bill. To conduct the study or to, to do the, the work of a study? Yeah. Okay. Senator Hoffman? Is, that, is, is it accurate to Senator Abler's point, is it accurate that the Human Services Finance Bill has this language in there? Is, does anybody know the answer to that? No, is, the background studies are from, as Madam Chair, background yeah. studies are in this committee. I think. Just in this one, they're not? Yeah. Okay. So, Madam Chair, if I added uh, just after the word must, um, think about it. <laughs> um, considering the feasibility, um, I don't know what else to do, Madam Chair. Everybody complains about this, um, and um, I'll work on something for the floor if I can find something free. So, Madam Chair, I'll, I don't want to torture us tonight with, but I just want to remind OIG people and the department: it's not working. People are leaving who wanted to come to work for us. But because of delays and the two-week repeat thing and going driving 50 miles from wherever and no appointments available, um, Senator Hoffman. Uh, Thank you, Madam Senator Chair, Madam Chair. Would Senator, Senator Hoffman yield for a comment? Uh, just, I, I just have one clarifying question before we go there. So to consider the feasibility of the department becoming a vendor, that would cost significant amounts of dollars, Ms. Didion? Uh, Madam Chair, the the language we worked out uh, um, in the other body for the uh, Human Services Finance Omnibus, uh, it, it's written differently. It has a, a contract uh, contractor conducting the feasibility study, um, and so this is a kind of it's a kind of unique study. Um, we know that there have been some other states that have have moved to becoming um, an FBI uh, fingerprint channeler, uh, and so. I, I think that there would be there'd be quite a lot of work. Um, I, again, I don't know if this would, the way this is written, I don't know if it would cost as much as uh, what we worked with the other body on, but l like I said, I, we haven't done a, Senator Hoffman. a fiscal note. But. Thank you, Madam Chair. To that point, did you hear what our friend from the OIG just said? Did, can you repeat that statement about in which committee over in the other body did you do that report for? Ms. Didion. Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman, uh, Human Services. Oh, so Senator that would Hoffman. that would be Representative Noor's committee. So Senator to Senator Abler's point. So that language is if it's similar, then we got a little jurisdictional issue here. But you know, um, I'm I like this conversation. I like where we're going, and if our good friend from the city of Minneapolis and the other body sees that as well, why not add it? Why not do some something? Madam Chair is what I'm saying. So, but I just wanted to say I was right. And Madam Chair, Senator Abler. Um, and I, I'm not impugning any particular thing, but as a system, what they, what, what they consider now is everything is fine. And I'd like them to consider that everything is not fine and find a way to make it fine, so the hospitals can find staff and everybody can find staff that we can trust that are suitable for our work. So, Madam Chair, with that. Uh, I, I'm just, yeah, my, I'm just frustrated, but I'll withdraw that for now, and I'll work on it for the floor or never. So. The A-10 yeah. is withdrawn. Did you have other amendments, Senator Abler, or is that? Okay. Senator Liskey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, can I move the A-25 amendment, please? Did you say which one? The A-25. 25. We do not have that in our pockets, no. so it is getting passed out. <laughs>
Senator Liskey to the A25. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, the A25 amendment is the uh, prior authorization bill that we heard in this committee previously um, from Senator Morrison, in which I am also, I believe, a co-author of the bill. Um, I find that it's very important, and it's something that I wanted to talk about uh, during the omnibus discussion, just, just out of uh, um, moving forward. And I, I, I understand there's a massive fiscal note uh, that will unfortunately ruin the, the budget that uh, Senator Wickland has worked so hard on, and I understand that. I, I just wanted to have a discussion about why this is important and why I think even though there might be a cost on the fiscal side up front, there's also a significant cost on the other side of not doing this. Um, and. Um, Senator Mann has alluded to those before, but really the issue is that there's a lot of patients out there that are suffering because they get stuck in a 90-day window of waiting for prior authorization. Um, perfect examples are patients with cancer. They get diagnosed. They have a stage 2 cancer, and it progresses to stage 3 or stage 4. It becomes quite close or becomes terminal, and in that time frame that we're waiting for prior authorization for treatment, it now becomes untreatable or is not treatable by the one that they're applying for and now have to start all over with the new process of a new prior authorization. Um, so with that, I, I just really wanted to have a couple of moments of discussion um, and see what other members have to say about it and kind of go from there. Senator Wickland. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Liskey, I, I certainly share your um, enthusiasm for, try, for doing something this session. I really do want to see something take place to address, um, address prior authorization because I think it, it has become a burden and, you know, the, the impact on the individual is, is really, you know, it's more than just unfortunate. It's, like you say, it, it's impacting lives. And so I'm, I'm happy to have the discussion about it. I was hopeful that, um, you know, that we would be able to find a way to include something that is manageable within our budget this year um, and hadn't reached that point when we put the budget together. Um, I think the what you've presented here is, is this the, the full bill language? Um, I think I really was um, supportive of the, the bill language that Senator Morrison had brought forward because I think it got um, it did start to get more selective about things that um, people are feeling this impact even uh, more substantially, you know, chronic conditions, cancer, um, you know, substance use disorder, medications, things like that seemed like, you know, the areas that we should be looking at, the really critical areas, but um, it's just the, the cost is um, really too much, that <laughs> more than we can incorporate. Um, but I am supportive of the concept and continuing to work on it. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, um, Senator Liskey, for bringing this conversation. I know Dr. Morrison, Senator Dr. Morrison, also has a conversation, and thank you for doing that. It just absolutely boggles me that the one state I came from, there was a health care provider who absolutely listened to what the doctors, the doctor would say, you need X, and we got X, right? And I'll never forget moving home to Minnesota from this other state. It's south of here, by the way, if anybody wants to look in their geographic map, the Mississippi River goes down there. And, and my bureau chief at the time, because I worked for a government agency, had said, you're going to HMO land. And I said, yeah, and, he, and, and fast forward, there was an article when Jesse Ventura was on the front page of the Star Tribune, and so was a story of me and my daughter at the time. And, and that really talks about prior authorization, right? It really does. It really leads into that conversation of prior authorization, being denied services. But the scary thing about this, in Lakewood Health System, right, there's a, in, in Staples, Minnesota, in your backyard, Senator Utke, is the cancer uh, doc. And, he talks about how the prior authorization, somebody came to him at, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but somebody that they could have treated and could have been life-saving treatment had to go through this process of getting prior authorization in order to get the treatment that would have been life-saving for that person. And in 90 days, 120 days went by, and that person went from level whatever to all of a sudden level four, and there was nothing that doctor could do. Could have done it before that, right? <laughs> Our own health system, when you talk to some of the docs, I'm apologizing to doctors because I'm asking them to make 
changes or to get some, you know, fill out this piece of paper in order to get a prior authorization. It's almost like you went from studying medicine and, and saving lives and being the doctor that you're doing to all of a sudden being, you know, a clerk and you're pushing paper and you're saying, I want this, I want that, but oh no, I have to fill out this one. And God forbid if it's the wrong doctor that you sign it on. That's really just mind-boggling to me. So I appreciate the good senator from um, just south of the Twin Cities, uh, the, the Senator Liskey. I knew the two cities that he's from because of the fact that we used to swim against that same high school. But it's sad that we have now become nothing but process paperwork. It's kind of like when you and I were on the school board, Madam, Madam Chair, Senator Wickland, right? What's the one thing we always heard? Well, if I could, you know, if it wasn't for those kids, I'd get my paperwork done, meaning those folks that were doing all the IEP work, right? The big stacks of papers. Now the same thing here. And it's really sad, Doctor, that, that here we are, that we really need to really push for getting rid of this prior authorization. If one state could do it, why can't this state do it? We're talking about lives here. So I'm glad to see this language in front of us. And it's sad that somebody put a, a fiscal note on there that is just really terrible. So with that, Senator Mann, I just wanted to get that point across. And thank you all for bringing this kind of stuff forward. Other comments? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, at this time, knowing that the budget would not be able to support this, I will uh, remove this amendment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Liskey retracts, what's the word? Withdraws the A25. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move the A6 amendment. The A6 in your packets. Uh, Madam Chair, this amendment is related to uh, family child care centers. And it is very simple. It would simply um, allow a bit of a grace period uh, for training for first aid and CPR. Um, it says that um, the, uh, those providers would have to renew it within 90 days of it being uh, initially taken. Uh, as someone who has to take uh, BLS CPR training myself, I know that it can often be tricky to get into a class as they are often full. And so this would allow, like I said, a bit of a grace period um, for folks to be able to get into a class and get this um, content renewed. I would say this would bring parity to um, uh, child care centers, and as it is the, currently the, the policy there, um, and so it would be the same. Uh, and also, we have worked with DHS on this language, and they are in support. Senator Wicklin. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I really, I really appreciate uh, Senator Bolden you bringing this forward. Um, I know I, I had conversations earlier this session about this, um, and discussed it with DHS, but I, I didn't, um, I hadn't heard of any possible solution. So I think uh, this is great if we can come up with something that gives, you know, reasonable flexibility, but doesn't also, you know, put any children at risk. So thank you for bringing it forward. I, I see it as a friendly amendment. Uh, questions about the A6? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A6 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A6 is adopted. And uh, we will go to the Next, Senator Bolden. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move the A37 amendment. Apologies, the A41. A41, in your packets. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, this amendment includes well-vetted policy language developed with the goals of increasing access to mental health care by decreasing administrative burdens, supporting staff to operate at the top of their license, and clarifying areas of statute. Our state continues, as we all know, to be in a significant crisis uh, in, in access to mental health care. And this amendment more broadly intent, is intended to support incremental and positive policy changes to increase access to quality care. Uh, I will again say this language um, has been vetted and uh, in, with significant consultation with DHS, many hours of consultation with DHS, and we thank them for that, and it does not have a cost. Uh, I'm happy to go section by section if that is desired by members, or I'm happy to take questions, and there are experts in, the, in our audience who can also answer questions. Thank you, Senator. We heard most of this already. Yeah. Um, Senator McLean. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, if this is something that's been worked out, and if it is um, language that we've heard, um, 
and the department is in support, um, I would be accepting of it. Members' questions? All those in favor of the A41 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A41 is adopted. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move the A2. No. No apologies. Yeah, we can move the A2. I don't. No A2. No A2. Well, the, the A2 right. is the, the underlying. Um... 19. Let's try the A19. Which one is that? It's very good. Thank you. A19 in your packets. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The A-19 uh, is a bill that was originally a bill by uh, Senator May Quaid, and I, I was a co-author on it. Uh, it prohibits health professionals or students or residents participating in a course of instruction, clinical training, or residency program from performing sensitive examinations on an unconscious or anesthetized patient without their informed consent. So the examinations that we're talking about here are a pelvic exam, breast, urogenital, or rectal exam. Um, and there is a movement at, across numerous states on the same type of legislation. If this were to be passed, we would join at least 20 other states uh, who are doing this. I will note um, uh, this uh, policy and bill has had uh, bipartisan support and happy to take questions from members. Thank you, Senator Bolden. This is a great bill. We've heard it before. Senator Weekland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I, I was just going to say uh, we heard it in the committee, and, and I th think we all we were very supportive of it. Um, it was referred to the Judiciary Committee and didn't get a hearing there, but I think because of um, time, and I think that Senator McQuaid indicated that she move, removed uh, the the one penalty um, part of the language. Is that correct, um, Senator Bolden? Questions, Senator Bolden. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, the penalty has been removed, so there's no jurisdictional issue anymore. Yeah. So thank you. I I would see it as a friendly amendment. Members, questions, thoughts. Seeing none. All those in favor of the A19 signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed. The A19 is adopted. Senator Bolden. One more, Madam Chair. Okay. I would move the A11. The A11 in your packets. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is related um, to the child care weighted risk system uh, that we heard earlier uh, and that is in the bill. This language would um, ask the commissioner to develop recommendations for an appeals process um, for statutory violations um, that don't result in documented technical assistance. And so the purpose of this would be to allow for some due process for centers who get a, a, a correction order to allow for a, a, a third party to weigh in um, and allow them to have that due process. Uh, as we are sort of changing the system and saying that you know some things are not a big deal and some things are a big deal, um, especially for the things that are a big deal, uh, it is important for those child care facilities to have due process to be able to appeal those. And so um, would just ask the commissioner to develop recommendations for what that might look like. Senator Bicklin. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Bolin, I did talk with um, DHS today about this. Um, I am supportive of trying to figure out um, if if the different um, risk levels have a means for people to appeal or, you know, um, yep, appeal, I guess, is really the, the word that I'm looking for, appeal um, when they receive some sort of correction. Um, I'm just, I'm not sure if this language is quite um, the way that I would like to see it, but um, it, it seems to expand um, quite significant how many or which um, items would allow for an appeal to an administrative law judge and I just I want to make sure that we're um, providing that to the the right type of cases but I am very much supportive of trying to understand how this fits in with um, changes to the weighted risk system or changing over to that weighted risk system um, and the use of the licensing hub um, would you be willing to continue to discuss it with them and then see if we can bring something forward that's maybe just a little more refined? Senator Bolden. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Weckland. Yeah, I'm, I will withdraw the amendment for today. I appreciate your comments and appreciate that there's perhaps some more work to be done with language, but um, wanted to just have the conversation. I think that the concept is right, that we should be looking at what is that due process mechanism for people to have the opportunity um, to have a decision appealed. Um, and so happy to continue to work on language for that. Okay. The A11 is withdrawn. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the A16. Um, so the A16 also deals with prior authorizations. Um, I will not get into prior auths right now because it's too late, and if I get this mad this late, I won't sleep well. Um, so so um, this is a very, very small step uh, to take. I understand that Senator Morrison's and Bill and Senator Liskey's um, amendment is too costly at this time, um, but all this will do is will make it so that what's in current law will apply to public programs as far as prior auths. Um, so that's really about it. <coughs> Senator Wickland. Well, oh, I have heard from Senator Morrison that she was working on a way to do, um, to be able to do something this session, and I appreciate that work, and I appreciate you bringing the fo this forward. Um, I think this is a good way to get a start and um, look forward to finding out more about if it does have a fiscal impact, what that is, so that we can, you know, review that in light of the other budget items that we have included. But I would like to see this incorporated. Great. And I would like to thank Senator Morrison for working on this topic. Questions? Senator Abler. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair, at the risk of triggering you so you don't sleep for the weekend. Um, <laughs> thank you for doing this. Um, the whole thing is simply bizarre. My view is that prioritization simply deprives somebody of necessary care, especially the ones that are always approved. There's some people that abuse, that are excessive in their care, then they should be the top 10 percentile or so of clinicians deserve what comes to them. But 80 percent do not. So thank you. Is that pretty good? Okay. All those in favor of the A16 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. The A16 is adopted. Uh, right now we're going to take a three to five minute recess. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, can I offer or move the A26 amendment? The A26 amendment is not in your packets. You can go ahead and talk about it as it's being passed out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, the A26 amendment um, is deleting section six on page 483. Uh, this is the medical, retrie medical record retrieval fees section. Uh, after hearing testimony this morning and actually looking into the pricing on how much it takes and costs to retrieve medical records, um, the m numbers that are currently in there, I'm a little bit concerned that they would basically force uh, entities to pay whoever is going to retrieve the records significantly less than a minimum wage even, um, because it actually costs quite a bit to retrieve records. Um, and so with that, I would like to, to talk about the uh, amendment that I brought forward and kind of see where we're at on that. Senator Wicklin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Liskey, I, um, this was a bill that we heard, um, actually it was two bills that Senator Seberger had. Um, she brought one of them as an amendment to the other, so we heard one bill and then amended on the other bill. Um, I've had some conversations with her because I've received information about um, concerns about the, the fee levels. Um, I think she, she has a lot more experience in this area and knows from her own personal experience and working in this field um, a lot about the costs and, and what is reasonable. Um, I guess my preference would be to um, to not do the work to delete that section tonight. 
Um, but for you to have a conversation with her or I can um, and talk to her about to see if there is a way that we um, could amend it to, I don't know, address the fee levels rather than just removing this section entirely, if you'd be open to that. Because I, I did feel that, you know, when we heard the bill that there was a, a certain uh, amount of uh, profit that was in this system, in this part of the system, um, from some of these activities. And um, so I, I would like to address that this session. Um, but I also would be open to, to learning more about, you know, what, what a more appropriate fee level would be or whether there's other modifications we could make. Senator Liskey, how would you like to proceed? Uh, Madam Chair, so I know, I don't know if she's still here. We had a specialist actually that works directly in this department. Um, I believe her name is Stephanie Luthy Terry. I know she sent me a letter um, discussing this. I don't know if she's still here, if she can come to the table. If she's not, that's okay. Um, but I would definitely take it offline if she's not here, just so we can talk about the, uh, the pricing and why it's so important. And uh, I agree. I don't think that there should be a profit margin on this. I don't think that's something that I'm aiming to try and fix with this amendment or this discussion. Um, it's more of a, there is an issue of going in the negative as well. And so we don't want to, you know, burden these these healthcare facilities any more than we already do with a lot of other discussion that we've had. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll take it offline. I'll, I'll withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Okay. H26 Thank is you. withdrawn. Senator Liskey, do you have another amendment? Yes, Madam Chair. I have the A17 amendment. A17 is not in the packet. you want to go ahead and talk about it while it's being handed out? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, so the A-17 amendment removes section 5 on page uh, 366 and section 6 on 367. Uh, this is the uh, bill from Senator Bolden. I've had these issues before and I discussed them at length and I'll continue to fight for it. I know we probably won't get anywhere with it tonight, um, but I still wanted to have the discussion one more time to address as to why I find it so important. Um, I, you know, I've heard from uh, a bunch of healthcare providers that I talked to in my own district uh, after this bill came forward and wanted to discuss their concerns and that's partly why I'm bringing the amendment tonight. Uh, their number one concern was that they generally don't have any intention of using the option. Of course, that's the reason why Senator Bolden was so sure of it, is that it's an option, right? It's not a mandate. Um, the concern that I have is that there's this thing called liability insurance. Um, all of those wonderful healthcare providers carry a liability insurance. And if they know that they're, they're as providers, not going to be able to maintain the same price of their liability insurance because they're no longer mandating these vaccines for their child center, um, they either A, have to change their policy no matter what, now it becomes a mandate even though it's an option by state law, it becomes a mandate by their liability insurance. And so that's something that I would be concerned with and why I have such a strong passion about what's happening with, the, with this part of the bill. Senator Wicklin. Um, well, perhaps Senator Bolden would like to address this. I think, so this would be removing the sections that would allow um, the child care centers and family child care providers to um, have the ability to um, set their own policy for vaccinations and if, um, and also decline to accept children who have conscientious objection, is that, uh, just to make sure that I'm talking about the sections. Senator Liskey. Yes, Madam Chair, that is correct. So basically this takes the language back to the way it is currently in that we would allow uh, conscientious objections. And I, I already hammered home why I thought those conscientious objections were so important at the last time we heard this bill. So I don't think we need to re-enter that discussion, but I just wanted to bring forward the discussions I've had so far. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would ask members for a no vote on this amendment, and uh, we had pretty robust discussion in this committee uh, on this previously, but this uh, it, it is not a mandate. It, it does offer options. It offers options for um, child care centers who uh, are small businesses to be able to set policies for themselves, um, and it offers options for parents um, who want to take steps to be able to keep their kids safe. Um, there are a, a number of reasons why kids may not be able to be vaccinated. Um, I also, it was brought to me, this allows options for child care providers to themselves keep 
you know, to keep themselves safe as well. Um, I, I heard a story recently about a childcare provider who was immunocompromised, and so, um, you know, wanting to be able to set that um, policy for their own business um, is something uh, I believe they should be able to do. Very good. Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, like I said, I agree with you. I think the way it's written is not that it's a mandate. Uh, again, my concern isn't about the law itself. Um, the concern is about what the unintended consequences might have going forward. And so that's something that I just wanted to bring forward. Senator Abler. Well, I think we discussed this pretty well before. Um, but I also want to caution, uh, well, the, the chair of the committee who is a and the committee who are very worried about access to child care, this will actually deprive some people of their child care <laughs> in their locale, which is now harder to find um, because they simply are not going to comply with this. For any reasons they may choose, we allow conscientious objections. So just wanted to enter that in just so I said it. And so I, I think it's not a good addition to the bill. Thank you. As always. All those in favor of the A17 signify by saying aye. All those opposed? No. no. The amendment does not pass. Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the A20 amendment. A20 is in your packets. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair and members, um, A20 deals with summer internships um, and start with as you look at uh, the internships are with hospitals clinics nursing facilities uh, home care providers etc but you'll see that the new language says assisted living facilities and that's because last year the assisted living facilities became licensed so this um, is just catching up to what has been in statute all along with the other licensed facilities and um, deals with uh, both secondary and post-secondary summer health care interns. Um, and it just uh, gives more, more of the interns more opportunity. And uh, with that, I think it's uh, hopefully pretty non-controversial. Senator Wigland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't know a lot about the summer internship program. I know that it's something run or administered by the commissioner of, or the, the health department, but I believe that the um, nonprofit organization is uh, Minnesota Hospital Association that, that actually runs the, the program. Um, I've, I only know that I've heard that it's a good program and valued, but I don't know if they would have any opinion about adding this is another option um, as a placement opportunity for interns. Um, so I guess I, I don't have a lot of information to go on. Um, I don't know if you've talked to um, the Department of Health or... And the department is giving a thumbs up. Thumbs up, okay. Okay. And if no one else is um, coming up to say that they don't support it, then I would be accept it would be acceptable to add it. Okay, any questions? Okay, all those in favor of the A20 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A20 is adopted. Senator, who wants to go next? Are we done? <laughs> <laughs> Senator Abler. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll move the A, uh, the A18. 18 is in your packets. And we discussed this before. The reason I'm bringing this now, this just talks about uh, adding detransitioning to the uh, transitioning insurance coverage. And since we met, I have some new information, which may or may not impress the committee, but I thought well, these should be factually based. Um, this, this would, uh, we're uh, requiring at least the Minnesota fully insured market to uh, provide with uh, gender transitioning services and. Um, that's um, in the bill. Um, but I, uh, I asked uh, Blue Cross, uh, the discussion when we had this hearing when Senator Dibble was here was, oh, it's this, this language covers that. Uh, I will tell you it does not. Uh, and it's not now covered, at least at Blue Cross. And I would imagine that that's similar. And I just wanted to redo what I got from uh, Blue Cross. 
Uh, quote, our medical policy was developed in accordance with the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPATH, standards of care which considers breast and genital surgical interventions for gender affirming care irreversible. WPATH advises patients um, has sufficient time to absorb information fully utilizing a multidisciplinary approach before providing fully informed consent for these irreversible surgical treatments. Our medical policy considers reversal of breast and genital surgical procedures not medically necessary and therefore not covered. And I'm not interested in prolonging the debate. I'm not going to ask people to vote on this. But I want people to understand that I don't think the informed consent is always fully done. Um, I, it, the, it's um, just to caution people. It's, this is not a minor thing. My view on this all is that it, we should be discussing these procedures with people over age 18, uh, then with informed consent, uh, as Europe has done, and provide support to the uh, individuals who are under 18 uh, in appropriate manners short of these irreversible procedures. So um, just thought I'd bring that up. And uh, I'm not asking for a vote, but I needed some reason to bring the topic up just for the enlightenment of the committee. And um, as I said on the floor uh, when we discussed the whole big debate about the whole transgender stuff, it's, it's not nothing. It's a big deal, and uh, it needs to be respected as the big deal that it is. So that's all I have, Madam Chair. Are you withdrawing the A18, Senator? I was waiting for you to say anything. I'll, I'll say yes, I'll withdraw the A18. A18 is withdrawn. Madam Chair, I have more. <coughs> Go ahead. Something. Um, anyway, so this is, I'd like to move the A21. And I think this is something that um, the committee can, this is, um, this has to do with um, the critical access mental health uh, rates. And I just mentioned this to um, Senator Wicklin, and I don't expect us to vote on this tonight either, but I want to provide this as useful help. Um, I've gotten, I suppose everybody's like, write your senator so you can get the money back, but um, the, uh, there is a small increase uh, from last year on these crisis, on these critical access mental health services, which I want to remind people, are mental health services to people who are the lowest income, most needy people. Uh, these aren't, um, these aren't commercial policies. This is, frankly, the, uh, the single-payer program that Minnesota has, at least our erstwhile single-payer program, Madam Chair, uh, to provide services to people who have disabilities and, uh, and uh, who are quite uh, in need of that. And so I think the cost of this runs like 3 or $6 million. And I think if we were in, in the bill, there's a placeholder for a rate increase, which actually the people who written me are very grateful for a nod about that. Um, but if, as the senator brings her bill forward, you might consider to see if this actually could be a way to undo these rate cuts, which are putting people as harm way, in harm's way and actually affecting access. So maybe Senator Wickens just want to, wants to comment about that. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, um, thank you. I, I appreciate you know bringing the topic forward. Um, it is something that um, I have heard from people about as well. Um, I think our our system um, and our rates are just um, not, they haven't kept up. And over time, we have, not me, but um, in prior years, various uh, patchwork of rates have been put in place and um, trying to figure out a way to move things forward in a, in a more straightforward way where we are addressing all of these providers' needs, you know, and, and also compensating them at the appropriate level. Um, it certainly is part of the discussion that we need to have about how to fix our rate system. Um, I think I, I am aware that, you know, this making a change like you've provided in this amendment is something that we could consider um, as an option this year. I'd like to first have discussion about um, how the, the information from the rate study and the bill that we developed uh, from that, how we could consider that first and then see, you know, see if how much we could do with that this year. Um, but I'm, I appreciate your bringing this to my attention too as another possibility, and I, I agree that 
um, these providers are serving a really important pur purpose. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, and, and thank you for that. Um, and so the reason this kind of, I was just going to offer this and just bring it up, but then I saw in your bill that you would put some money aside for a rate increase, a number to be determined, and it's not a very big number, I don't think, with the amount you have. And thank you for trying to, I think we were ahead of the House on trying to get rate, rate increases last year. But, but short of the rate study even being done, this is a reduction that's going to go forward that's going to truly hamper people's ability. So at least if we can get people back to par, that, and I think the money you have may be adequate. So uh, that's my only, it's meant to be a friendly discussion to you, and I know you're concerned about it. So, uh, Madam Chair, with that, I will with, uh, withdraw that amendment. But Madam Chair, Madam Chair, it's, there's another amendment. I'd like to, if you notice, I put all mine out in public so people would know. So we, um, anyway, I'd like to move to 829. 829 in your packets, go ahead. And 829 has to do with services at birth centers. And uh, birth centers are phenomenal. Their outcomes are remarkable. Uh, the hands-on, close touch that happens there uh, generate considerably less negative outcomes than other places. We spend a good deal of time talking about um, African-American and tribal um, birth efforts. Okay. Uh, this is totally compatible with that. Um, I just want to read something from uh, Dr. Steve Calvin, who uh, has a birth center, uh, just uh, over on Smith. And it's, uh, if you wanted to ever take a tour of a very wonderful birth center, uh, he is there. He's they're very professional. Uh, they incorporate every clinician that makes sense to in that arena. Uh, but frankly, they're being starved out of existence. And. Um, I don't know all the facts about what they were supposed to get, but I believe they were supposed to get some kind of funding, and it didn't come through. But I'll read this, and then we can talk about it. Um, so there's broad community support for the high-quality maternal and newborn care provided by midwives in birth centers integrated with hospital safety nets. Legislation licensing birth centers passed nearly 15 years ago. Uh, birth centers provide improved outcomes that address racial disparities, as well as significant cost savings. Truly cost savings, Madam Chair. Uh, unfortunately, one Minnesota birth center is closed and others are at risk because of unsustainable reimbursement, particularly from DHS Medicaid and Medicaid managed care organizations. Despite, despite paying initially for newborn care, uh, DHS made an administrative decision to not pay birth centers for newborn care, which makes no sense to me. Uh, and I'm calling attention to that with this amendment. So maybe there's some way to fix that short of this tonight. Uh, this amendment simply clarifies language in the statute to require DHS and the managed care organizations to pay a modest facility fee for the newborn care currently provided in birth centers. Uh, this amendment provides significant cost saving since low risk babies born in birth centers are six times as less likely to be unnecessarily admitted to a NICU uh, according to a large 2023 study including U of M researchers. So, um, I've known this uh, particular man, Dr. Calvin, and some similar ones for a long time, and they're extremely dedicated. And we find a way to starve the cheap stuff that works really well and spend tons of money later on. And so, um, Madam Chair, just like your comment, I don't intend to have, make you vote on this tonight, but if you could just offer your comment about, is there somewhere we can try to remedy some of this? Uh, Senator Wigland. Madam Chair, Senator Abler. Um, I'd, I'd like to know more. Um, I don't think I'd, I'm not very familiar with um, with birth centers and how the um, DHS classifies them. And so, you know, I, I guess I would like to understand better what what this would entail. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I'm not supportive. I'm, I just need more information. And then, you know, would this specific language have um, have a cost, I guess? So I'm, I'm oh, having sure. a hard time at assessing that from just reading it. So I would appreciate a chance to talk with DHS about it. Thank you, Madam Chair. And the beauty of tonight's forum is that everybody's listening at DHS tonight because, like, what's going to come up? And, you know, what's Senator Kupek going to bring tonight to surprise us with? Or perhaps me, they might wonder. But um, thank you for that. And uh, But I, I think that... You know, in healthcare and the quality of care we want, and the commitment in your bill already to some of the, you know, the, the BIPOC needs, 
this is part of that, and it's already operational. And so mm -hmm. where we're hoping to have people say, oh, please breastfeed. Like, really? Didn't know that. Um, a lot of that happens in places like this that are actually closing due to lack of funding. So, Madam Chair, did you want to comment at all on this idea? No. Are you going to withdraw the A29? <laughs> if I do, I'll promise I won't withdraw the next one. How does that go? I'll withdraw that, please. Okay. A29 is withdrawn. Madam Chair, I only have two more. Senator Abler. But I saved the second best. Well, actually, the best one is for last. But um, I'd like to move to A30. A30, in your packets. Go ahead. And uh, this actually will be voting on this. So um, This is the... Um, the title is moratorium, and that's not actually correct. This is a hospital closure, uh, Department of Health, uh, public interest review. Um, and we have talked, uh, Senator Kupak had a bill that talked about a moratorium. Today's paper, Manoman Clinic is closing. Faustin closed. Uh, Albert Lee moved their first center over to uh, Austin uh, in Coon Rapids. Uh, the pediatric department is to close or shrink markedly. I think they've kind of backed off a little bit. Uh, the unity, the OR, and the ICU are to be closed. Um, and we're assured by the, uh, by the runners of that hospital. I don't need to I've mentioned the name enough times that I'm not really wanting to get after them. But like, um, we are faced with a world of cliffs, Madam Chair and Madam Chair and members, um, we have, over time, uh, as the, the people who run the state-funded programs have habitually underfunded hospitals uh, to an extreme. We didn't even give the governors $41 million last year to do the 25% of what we really needed to bail out hospitals from, from days where they were having people stuck there. Uh, we came up with pocket change. We didn't even do rebasing. And as a result, places like Monoman are in trouble anyway. They have a small population, but 80% of their people up in Monoman were either state or uh, federally funded programs. Um, where you hear about North Memorial, 74%, uh, and they're at risk. And so, but what's happened besides, and I'm not going to belabor this, but is we've had consolidation after consolidation from great little places Senator Mann, back there was a day when people in your situation would have your own clinic or would have three of you and you would run your operation and have your own staff and you'd get insurance and people would pay, and it, and it worked. And over time, we've now moved to the point that a lot of doctors are simply employees. You heard today from some doctors from Mercy. They actually have, it's going so well, they unionize and over the challenges. And you heard their testimony. I didn't know if so many were coming, but it was compelling about what's going on. And so the question really is, who decides? I mean, we have a job, I think, to fund. And I think um, you can blame both parties for not sending enough money out there. But there's some things you should have done, like rebasing and, and, and so on. That, like, I know you have a heart for that. I just don't know why the House and the governor just didn't stick for that, why they would accept not doing that. Um, but we have a system on the verge of collapse. And as we add more and more people into public programs and pay them less than the cost of doing business, what do we think is going to happen? More of this. And then we're told, oh, but you have to trust the, uh, trust the administrators at these hospitals. They mean, they mean well. Um, and so I frankly think they're fine. But their, their corporate interests, which is not a swear word, but they need to run their own thing and keep it going by the decisions that have been made over the last decade in consolidating. Unity Hospital was sold to, for a dollar to this company, and the people were so happy in the neighborhood, oh, we got a hospital. Uh, it's not going to close. And, but so who should decide? Shouldn't there be like some overseeing entity that would tell us, yes, you have sufficient places to offload? Um, in, in Mercy, they will, I was, I, we've had meetings, you can tell, I've been a little strong about this. Um, but go to Mercy, they're a great place. So it's nothing to worry about, but it's a quality place to go to the ER and all that. But um, with the plans that are going on, they haven't, they, there's no agreement with children's to take the kids they can't handle for overnight. 
And sometimes if you have to wait long enough to go to Children's from Anoka and Grand Rapids and north in uh, St. Francis, that's too long. There was a story told by one of the fathers. If they would have waited to go all that way, the kid would have been, uh, would have died. But they went to Mercy and got the care they needed. That care needs to be maintained, in my opinion, or somebody who knows this business better than me needs to say, you have a good equivalency. And so my, the moratorium, um, I voted for that. Um, but that's, that's meetings. We had a meeting. They had the meeting. They informed the staff. Um, they, they announced in the meetings, we had two jobs, inform the staff and have a meeting. So we had our meeting. They took, they took comments until the next day. Can you believe that? Whoa, comments. And then did what they were going to do. And you heard the doctors and to this morning and the nurses saying, it's not adequate. They have no vested interest in that. They, they, I don't think they are, their jobs were the primary concern. They're concerned, Dr. Mann and Dr. Morrison and everybody that is about the welfare of the patient. And so I fully believe that we need the Department of Health to sit down and have a, a take it to the Department of Health. They have a whole group of experts. Is your plan sufficient to provide for the welfare of my people in my neighborhood and the people in Minoman and the people in Albert Lee and the people coming to a town near you? And so rather than just allow them to close, but to have this review. And so what this calls for is, and I think we can make it, my, my idea is to have it, they have to look at it, not like the whole year long process, like citing a hospital, but there would be a public interest review. And as it moves forward, and I hope it does, uh, words to show that this is meant to be expeditiously done, but somebody who doesn't have a vested interest in the outcome to make sure that there's adequate care for the needs of that community. And this, that's what this amendment does. And so, um, Madam Chair, I appreciate hearing your opinion about this. Senator Wicklin. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I mean, I, um, I guess I'll say that I found the testimony this morning um, very compelling as well. And I, I do find it very concerning that um, there can be areas of the state where they don't have the, the services available in a reasonable, um, a reasonable access time. And I think that some of the decisions that are being made, I, I don't really understand how they're being made and how they're looking out for um, the communities that they serve. Um, I'm not sure that, that this particular method of trying to get more accountability and um, oversight is the right way to do it. Um, I have a concern about the way this this language is structured that um, that it needs a lot more discussion about just this ability to impose a process like this. Um, I think the you know we put in Minnesota put the uh, hospital moratorium that process the public interest process in place, and now you know quite a long time later I don't know decades later I guess we're finding that that process. Is it really serving the purposes that that we um, put it in place for? Is it serving our needs now? And it and I think it should be looked at um, whether it is serving the needs that we have now. Um, is there a way to get at the question that you're asking? Um, I I think there there might be a way to do it, um, but I I think that this the way this is laid out. I'm just not sure that it it does it would accomplish that. Um, yeah. I would have preferred to have this, you know, several weeks ago, so we could have had a, uh, a hearing on it and a discussion about it. I know that we don't always get a chance to have things when we um, need to have them, but um, I really hesitate to to put it in the bill. Um, just because I, I think it needs more discussion about what are we trying to accomplish and would this type of process really bring us closer to doing that? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, uh, Madam, Madam Chair and, and Senator Wicklin. Yeah, this, this, is an, this is an ongoing discussion, right? We used to you know, have little stickers in the uh, Anoka, Coon Rapids area. Take me to mercy, right? And it's like, it's not just about mercy. I mean, those those stories, are, you know, the, 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 the like you said, were really compelling. 
And it's really how can we as a system, us, right, what efforts do we need to increase, you know, care access? We need to alleviate the boarding issues, right? Specifically, you know, and not just in our, when we look at the Northwest Metro campus, you know, the two mile, the nine miles apart between Fridley and Coon Rapids, right? But but really the whole issue, where, where are we going? This is, this is a systems conversation, I'm, you know, um, this is this is full of oh stuff to do now right but I think Senator Wilkins right I I think we need to address this head on Senator Abler like a full on you know piece on that because it really gets down to efforts to increase care access help alleviate the boarding issue that exists out there and are we doing what's appropriate to the evolution of of how these hospitals are are changing so um, that's I. I I, I, I agree with the Senator Wicklund on that, but I, I love the fact that what you're doing on this, and I want to work how we can. Does that make sense? Senator Aylor. Um, yeah, let's talk about it some more, shall we? Let, let's watch the system not serve people. Let's let North Memorial decide they're going to close some wings. Let's let Monoman County close again. Let's let Faustin not have anybody there. We talk. We talk, and and this is new. I admit that, um, but there is. So let me tell you what what is going to happen in the North Metro when somebody wants to need an overnight pediatric bed and it's not there, and there's no other pediatric beds to get down to to, to children's, and the group running this hospital doesn't even have an agreement. Starting in June, and so, Madam Chair, I would ask you to please accept this into your bill and we'll continue to work on it. It's a big deal. And I know it's a little beyond your comfort zone, but um, this asks the Department of Health, Minnesota's trusted health agency, with a commissioner and a review process and a team. And it, it could be as something as simple as a one-month review where they say, we think that's going to be all right. But I will promise you in this case, they're not going to say it's all right. And as I knocked on my doors and I, the people said, We're gonna, I trust you to go work on stuff for me. But this is not just going to, it's, it's going to go, it's, it's happening all across the state. And so maybe then as um, people work together better, but you have to have somebody who doesn't have a dog in the fight to say we're closing it. Madam Chair, I'll let you react to that. Senator Wicklin. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I mean, I... It's hard to disagree with you that, it, you know, by moving language for, forward like this, it would show that we are serious about it. Um, I just really have a concern that, that this isn't, that I'm not sure that this process, this way, this method is going to get at what you're trying to, to get at. And I would really prefer to have a discussion about, you know, what are some options and talk with the Department of Health. Have they thought about, um, you know, the types of oversight that they do today? And is there a way that we could have, we could extend that to oversight of, um, you know, particular closure transactions or, or um, operational changes? I just feel like I'm not equipped to to know whether this is um, is possible using them, you know, using the authority of the Department of Health. So I, I'm really torn because I do feel, you know, I really understand what you're getting at. Final thoughts before we vote. Well, Madam Chair, I can't get the voices out of my head from the doctors this morning. I can't get the voices out of my head from the nurses who are desperately worried about what's going to happen. Um, I'm thinking about asking for a roll call. That's how serious I feel about it. When's the last time I asked for a roll call on anything? And I would hope people could just vote yes to move it forward so it can be discussed. Because I'm going to tell you, there's no other, the, the moratorium thing, God bless a moratorium. But a moratorium actually denies reality. There may be that the best thing that can happen is that it closes um, in some time, and moratoriums 
they just move people out, and pretty soon you have no hospital left there, but it's open. That happened with before. So I would hope that members could vote yes on this to support the doctors and the nurses. Um, you heard, you know, the groups that want this to pass. You heard them this morning. And so I think it would be great if this committee could say, we want to find a better way. And there's enough time in the process, and I won't be stubborn about this, but I, I think that the, the question is, should the Department of Health have an opinion about the safety of my people, of your citizens, Senator Wickland, as you worry about North Memorial and then whatever happens in Moorhead and St. Cloud, it's, it's going to spread more and more. So, I don't know. Would you hate me if I asked for a roll call? Please vote yes. And we'll continue to work on this. And this committee will be the ones that say, we are the health committee of the Senate. We've decided we're going to stand up and we're going to make sure that the people are squared away in, a, in the beginning of a process. And when the bill goes in, then people have to come and talk. If it's an amendment outside that didn't pass, so then it's just something that we can just ignore and um, just leave people at risk across the state. So, Madam Chair, I guess I'll ask for a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Abler, if, I just got a question for you on this um, because honestly this created quite a stir this afternoon and none of us had seen the, uh, the, the language until we got here. Yeah. And so it's, it's trying to figure it all out. But I, I brought up the statute that's referenced with this public instant interest review. But as you put this together, what do you view as the timetable and all of the investment of time to put this together, um, what, what, what truly is all included in what you've got in the top part? Because I do see that if the hospital ceases, ceases operations due to insolvency, it doesn't affect that. But it's right. if they're going to move or do something like a relocate, yeah. right? Yeah, like the Sorry, situation we have. And so, and staff being what it was, I didn't get this until this afternoon when I asked for it. Uh, actually several days ago, and they've been very busy doing other things, and so I don't fault them, I just fault this. I would have loved to have language we could have talked about, but, and I know it's fresh. Um, but I've done enough things, and you know my, my, um, my honor in trying to find a way to work things out, but sometimes you gotta get a bill moving. But my idea is like, I don't know, a month? So in this case, Alina would go to the department, and I'll say, we're, we're dying here, or we have too much space, and then they would, there would be a, they would have the meeting with people there and it would take one, two, three months and they would go back and forth and then the Department of Health would, would say, we believe there's enough capacity in the area to handle so you can close the OR but not the ICU, something like that. And so there's something more than simply economic con considerations or convenience considerations. There is no backup north of Children's in the metro. If we go, uh, Mercy has like the busiest ERs. Those two are the busiest around. And, and so I would like somebody more, that's, that's what I'm after. So they would go like, you know, I, we don't think you should close that ER. Um, and we think you should be allowed to do this other one. That's, my, that's how I would suggest it would be in a, not the year long site of hospital mm -hmm. project. I don't even care if they have hearings. I would like them to decide it internally. Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Abler. And I, uh, just a, a further follow-up or a thought. I'm not comfortable with this as it sits, and I have concerns, and I guess I'll just think out loud. Would, if Senator Abler and Senator Wickland, if there was a way that rather than having it be addressed tonight on a vote, but if it could continue, this is going to be what, next stop is finance, <clears throat> then the floor. If it was something legit, if it could be added at a later step, because I just, I'm uncomfortable with it. Thank you, Senator Arkey. Uh, I, I agree, I, I love it. And I wish it had been a bill yeah. two months ago because we would have gone through committee and vetted it, because we all know that bills have unintended consequences and we have just, something of this magnitude, we should have in all the committees. Um, I, I, I love the idea. I think we should do it, but not like this. I'm concerned of moving something this big and this, 
it, it affects so many things without having it properly vetted. And a, a public interest review, although ideally in a month or two, they take a year sometimes. So do we need to put parameters in this bill to say it needs to be done within two months or three months? Or you know what I mean? So there's so much more to talk about. And I think we should do it just as an amendment with brand new language on the day of, I don't think is the best way. My two cents. Senator Abler. Well, Senator Mann, would you help me um, with this? So I'm not asking, I'm just, I just don't know what else to do. I am, I have argued till I'm blue in the face. I talked to them <laughs> privately and said, what are you doing? How is this ever going to work? And so the, the people coming to harm are the people in Senator Hoffman's in my backyard. But it's coming to a backyard near you. So um, Senator Wickland, if we work on this, would you help me? Madam Chair, Senator yes, Wickland. I would. Senator Uber, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to work with you. Well, thank you. Then I'm, I'm not here to embarrass people. I'm not here to get a vote of some purpose. I want to make a difference. And I think the pediatric thing should not go. And I, I just, you know, um, I've been harsh to Alina. And they came to me and said, could you tone it down a little bit? We do care about people. And I know they do. But this is a statewide problem. And it's more and more it's happening as we put more and more people into these programs. So, uh, Madam Chair, I... Thank you for your support in this. And I, I, I think I'll withdraw it now and, and work on it. Um, I appreciate that. 830 is withdrawn. Senator Abler. I just have one more, and this is much softer. If Mr. Pollock would come up. Um, this is actually be kind of funny. So, but I, I want to thank people for their attention to this. And a lot of the work we do here is really pretty grave, how it, we affect people, and it's, it's a political process, but at the end, we all care a lot. Anyway, so Madam Chair, I'll move the A34. A34, in your packets, go ahead. And this is actually, uh, got to change gears. This is back to background studies. Um, and so, talking to Mr. Pollock there, um, there's a company here, there's a, he'll, he can mention it, we won't take very long on this, but um, there's a way to get 5,000 workers into the industry to do long-term care, hospital care, whatever, uh, if we can allow companies to be flexible and pre-screen people, so then they can go plug into a job that's available. <coughs> and I'll just, with that, I, I'm just very impressed by this, and there's a few snags just because of the technicalities, but this is an idea that makes a lot of sense. And, and Madam Chair, we did get approval on part of this, so you're not, not gonna demand anything of you tonight, but. So if Mr. Pollock could comment about this, I think this is an idea that could be a game changer. So thank you. Mr. Uh, Pollock. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Abler, this is uh, basically a, a very pared down version of Senate File 4228. It's just um, trying to provide a pathway for prospective worker platforms to operate in Minnesota. They've um, this particular company has been trying to uh, offer a worker platform since 2021. A version of this already passed the Senate in 2022. Um, they are already operate in about three dozen other states across the U.S., but because of our kind of unique um, version of Net Study 2.0 and relationship with the FBI, they haven't been able to find a, a kind of workable solution here. Um, so just looking for some kind of placeholder language. And, and there have been lots of discussions. We've met with DHS. We've reached out to MDH. We've talked to D DPS, the Hospital Association, SEIU, the Minnesota Nurses Association, and the Long-Term Care Imperative. So there, there's been a lot of work done on this uh, initiative already this year. Thank you. Senator Wigland. Um, Madam Chair, I guess one question I would have is what um, – what type of language was passed here or in Minnesota in the past? I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand what we have had discussions on before. Senator Abler or Mr. Pollock. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Wickland, the language that passed the Senate did not become law. It, it was part of that 22 conference committee that um, nothing ever came of it, but it's much more similar to what is in Senate File 4228. Um, this, is just, this is just a placeholder for... Mm -hmm continued discussions. And I think even this entire thing might not be acceptable, but some smaller portion might be. Senator Wigland. Mm, Madam Chair, I don't, I'm trying to rack my brain to remember if we heard Senate file 4228. I, is that a bill of yours, Senator Abler? 
Is that mine? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. Okay. Right, Madam Chair. No, I don't think we did. Okay. But, Madam Chair, I'll just tell you, um, it's, this is the comical part. We needed a little levity after that last discussion. But So the, the department has agreed that lines um, 1.6 to 1.11 are acceptable, which creates uh, a definition. Um, <laughs> that's funny, right? Um, and But it, if there's a way that we could figure out a way. So there's, there's 5,000. These, these companies are able to attract people, and they pre-screen them, and then they can go plugged in. And now they're ready to go to work tomorrow for home care or wherever. Um, and so if we could adopt that section only that just provides a definition, then per, if there's a way between now and the end of this process to make this actually work, uh, this actually would generate revenue because they would all, they would, each person would be paying the $44 times 5,000, which is a quarter million or something. So it's not going to necessarily cost anything. This, the definition doesn't cost anything. Um, and then we can see if there's a way we can try to make this work. I, um, you can tell I'm worried about a bunch of things, background studies and getting people working, being one of them. So thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Wicklund. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know if, well, if, if that part has been discussed with DHS and, um, and MDH, or is it just MDH? Are they Mr. willing Pollard, to comment? It's just not. Uh, the comment is just okay. at this point. Okay. I don't know if they have, if there's someone who could provide a comment on that, I would appreciate it. So, Madam Chair, this would become then a placeholder for something to work out. If, if nothing gets worked out more than that, I'm not sure if we need the definition, but at least it's a, something to... To yeah. remind us that this is something we hope to get squared away. I mean, it's it's uh, Senator Abler. It's my understanding that even with this definition change, the prospective worker platform, it doesn't address the FBI's issue with the term of the use contractor, and so it's still not an FBI compliance. So it, it doesn't comply with federal law, as far as I understand, even with this definition change. But maybe uh, Ms. Timon has more to say about that. Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, you know, we talked to Mr. Pollack earlier tonight. We don't see an issue with just paring it back down to the definition. Um, don't really know what it's doing at this point, but we, we're not seeing an issue with it right now. Mm -hmm. So let me put it in. So we just yeah, we're gonna sure. just add a random yeah, definition sure. to the yes. bill for <laughs> <laughs> There's a bigger issue. So Madam Chair, I would move uh, just the first 11 lines. <laughs> lines 1.1 1 .1 to 1.11. Okay. So I, I would um, recommend a no vote today, just because. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, any more comments? Madam Chair, I'd recommend a yes vote. I mean, this, okay. maybe we can get this worked out. So. We can get it worked out, but. Not today. Uh, all those in favor of the 834, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. 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 The 834 is not uh, adopted. I think. I Any more that. amendments? Yeah. Well, Madam Chair, I may be able to think of some more amendments. Um, I just want to to the to the bill. To the bill. Um, and I have a. I'll save a lot of my thoughts about for the bill on the floor. Um, but I. I just want to thank the committee for the discussion, particularly about the challenges in hospitals. And I hope that we can find a way to fund them in the way they need to be funded uh, with, the, with the beds. You know, there's, there's 10 beds getting fixed in the other bill. Um, but I, I just want to remind people that my, I have many more comments that I'm not going to offer. I took up a lot of time on that hospital thing. Um, but we really need to think as we advance more people into state paid programs and, and do Minnesota Care for All um, that we're actually going to exacerbate some of these things and even Medicare rates make it hard for them to, to do their work. So um, insurance companies actually as a clinician for 45 years I think sometimes they are evil um, but they're a necessary part of what we do here. Um, not really evil they're just they have their job to do as well but um, I think we need to make sure that we don't not have them uh, to handle the commercial market. And I also did want to offer one thing. I got a note from the 49ers, and they were, they were, there was, that was not in the packet, I guess, but the 49er union 
uh, has a great program, all paid for by the employer. And their concern is, as we move into, in the bill, we're doing public option, that some of the companies that are not very good companies, that aren't, you know, of that same caliber and union as, as them, are going to be able to provide health care for their workers uh, for free, uh, which would actually, and also would undermine uh, some of the motivation of the employers to continue their excellent program that they have. So I just wanted to caution you about that. But I want to thank uh, the chairs for their respect of, of my thoughts tonight. And uh, I think we have a good committee, and I think that the bill, well, whatever. <laughs> now, there's a lot of good parts to it. I'm glad the African American uh, Welfare Program is in there. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm done. Members, comments to the bill? Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yeah, there's a lot of things that we could uh, dig into, but we'll have chances uh, with future hearings. But I do have uh, uh, two items that I'd like to um, dig into a little bit deeper, or get a little more information on. And the first is the uh, prohibition for the for-profit HMOs, which is in this bill. Um, we have. 30 to 31,000 people who are going to need to be reassigned. Um, and I've got a, a challenge with that a little bit because I did it finally just before this uh, hearing started uh, from the department. I, we're trying to find out what's that going to cost us. And the response I got was nothing. Well, if I, th I think if I went in and asked what would it, what did it cost us for 31,000 going through the redetermination process, there was a cost to it. We paid a lot of money for these various things. Um, you know, and in this case, we have both the state, the department, um, and we've got counties. Uh, Ramsey County's involved for one. Um, they're going to get some additional workload dropped on them. I, I think this is ill conceived in a way because we're just. Uh, the state now is, is, is telling me there is no fiscal note. Uh, I, as I, in good humor, I said, I'll remember that the next time we have something we send to them with cost because we're going to want the same answer. There is no cost because you can't do all this for nothing and not account for it. Um, I guess I would have uh, a question uh, because this is a you know, it's a it's a forced change for the, this 31,000 population. What do we have in place for the continuity of care uh, with these renewals, the full plot process? Is there a plan that we know of? Uh, Senator Wickland. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Utke, it would be my um, understanding that if, if the language doesn't reflect it today, that that we work on it, um, so that the contracts that are currently in place that would be under managed care for public programs, that those contracts would be allowed to be to finish. And so we wouldn't, um, I would not advocate for a program or for something to go in place um, and have to actually, like you say, move people from, you know, in the middle of a contract. Um, to make a choice that they would have to move. So I, I believe that we have um, set it up that way, but that, that would be my intent. If it's not that way today, that that would be the language. And then I think that if it is that way, if a contract ends, I mean, when new contracting is done, you know, different players come in to the market or different plans might offer different options. That happens you know, in um, contract negotiations each time. And so then it isn't a matter of, I mean, sometimes the plan that somebody chooses one year, it might not be available the next year. I mean, I, th I think that could happen even today with just the, the nonprofit HMOs and the, the for-profit. So my belief is that we can do it in a way that is not um, a matter of disrupting you know, a number of thousand people in the middle of a contract. Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, another question uh, slightly related to that, um, and just for information is, 
is the termination of a duly authorized HMO license without cause a taking under Minnesota law? Do we know that if this is fully legal or if there's anything in the contractual agreement that would be causing a problem? Senator Wicklund. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Atke, I guess, is this in relationship to going back to the way our state regulations were set up before 2017 when we, we didn't allow for-profit um, HMOs to operate in Minnesota? So, I, I mean, I, I believe it was. We had it in place that way for all the time up to 2017 from whenever HMOs were created. And so I don't think that it would be illegal for us to go back to that. Is that what Sen you're asking? I'm Senator Arkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, it, those are just a few of the things, among others, that would concern with the, the HMO side. But um, I'll, I'll jump into the public option a little bit. Just looking at the way this is written in the bill today, um, first off, it doesn't go into effect until t 2028. Um, it, to me, it looks convenient. It gets it outside the tails and everything else. Uh, possibly accounting isn't a, accounted for. But uh, that, beside that fact, what is the plan for 26 and 27? Because at that point, there is no more reinsurance and all of that. And we kind of hit a real big dead hole um, that it looks like it could be, you know, we fully anticipate a real uproar, uh, a problem in the market, so any idea there? Senator Wicklund. Um, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Utke, uh, when I presented the bill in the committee, um, I talked about how I thought we needed a plan for the years that lead up to when the public option could be available. Um, we, didn't, we didn't choose 2028 because it's further than the budget horizon. Um, that was because um, the work that it would take to get the um, authorization from the federal government and to put the systems in place and allow for uh, an open enrollment period that led us to um, the date of 20, January 1st, 2028, when the plan could be offered. Um, so that was fully working with the agencies on, on when they could stand up this program. Um, as far as those years, um, 2026 and 2027, in my original bill, we had some um, other, other um, options that could help us in those years. Um, there's a cost sharing reduction plan that we could put in place. There's also a tax credit that might um, do the work that um, reinsurance is playing, the role that that plays today. Um, and there were some other um, subsidi subsidization programs. Um, so those were in the bill. They're no longer in the bill because um, at the leadership level, it was determined that, that we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have enough money to proceed with that in our target this session to proceed with those, um, those bridge proposals. I do think that it is absolutely critical that we do address those years, 2026 and 2027, um, and because of the way that the insurance plans determine their rates, um, the certainly the uh, what we do for 2026, you know, would have to be done very early next session. And I mean, I I am fully um, behind doing the work to prepare for next session so that we have an understanding of what our options are and what do we want to pursue to address those times or those years where uh, we haven't funded reinsurance and, um, and the, the federal tax um, credits are going to end at the end of 2025. So I, I believe you're correct that that work needs to happen and we need to address it. Um, and it's just not, we're not addressing it in this bill. Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and yes, that's kind of the one thing that caught my eye, because I, if I remember right from the original bill, it, it didn't wait till 28, and it started earlier, and it started with at the 300% of the federal poverty level. Um, so it was a little more of a phase, and now we do hit that deep hole, or so to speak, of the 26 and 27, 
mm -hmm. um, where there's nothing, and then in 28 we're jumping right into 400 percent. So we're adding a sizable number of additional people that would qualify. Um, and you know, number one, the reimbursement is at Medicare rates, which again is um, under the cost of doing business. And we t keep talking about all the places that are have closed or are closing or on the verge of closing. Um, and now we're going to load that up. So I think there's a lot of things to look at as you go forward because uh, not only do we have the two bad years, but we've got ahead of us what it's going to do to our whole industry. Um, and typically we think of the hospitals and the clinics and all that. Um, what's the one thing that's hurting super bad that we all hear about on a daily basis, and that's our ambulances, our EMT systems. They get paid through the same source, and that's what's killing them is that the, the Medicaid and Medicare reimbursements don't cover their costs. Um, it's, we've just got, <laughs> this is going to create a monster problem, a, uh, item that we're going to have to tackle instantly if this does pass through because um, the, the void in there is incredible. And I don't know how w everybody's struggling at this point. And uh, to me, I don't see this helping at all and only making that problem worse. So I hope that everybody moves forward with their eyes wide open. Um, you know, then you take into the fact that um, small business, the people that, uh, you know, the individual market, the small group that could qualify now for the, the, the state buy-in, we're moving people from a commercial pay policy to a policy that's uh, matching Medicare. We've, again, moved that group of people into um, sub-cost payers, their plans. Um, it, it, this thing just continues to snowball. And uh, I have a ton of concern. And uh, I hope that we can continue to work on things to try to save this industry. So with that, um, that's probably all I have for now. So thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Wicklund. Members, are there questions, comments? Senator Kupak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, Senator Wicklund, because I know this is a lot of work. Uh, also, I, I'd like to take a second just to thank staff. Um, it's amazing the work that you guys have done, um, you know, especially like some some schmoke, schmuck like me shows up and says, I got a, an amendment I'd like uh, this afternoon. Can you get that done? And there it is. It's done. So thank you for all your amazing work. Mr. Monahan over there who doesn't even staff this uh, committee very often, uh, thank you too for being here tonight. <laughs> Appreciate that, uh, all the work that, that goes in behind the scenes. Um, uh, and I want to, you know, a couple... Two things. I want to uh, go off of Senator Abler here um, and his hospital moratorium closure. Um, he's, on, he's on the right track, and, and I know where he's going, and I also know that that testimony this morning, you know, we talked about it. Um, it was pretty powerful stuff, and people, people are upset, but it is, it is I think it's a, sometimes a really complicated thing as to why these hospitals are closing. Some are maybe not for the right reasons, but there's other ones that, that, you know, sometimes in rural areas, they can't find anybody to staff them. And that's a problem. And some of that goes to the Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement rates, like Senator Utke was saying, you know, and if our federal government did something, um, <laughs> probably would make our lives a lot easier here at the state level. Uh, sometimes I feel like all we're trying to do is fill in the gaps and patch for the, for the letdown that our federal government um, is getting nothing done. So um, that that's, we're trying our best, I think, with, with the resources we have, so I appreciate that. And I will also, uh, also on Senator Abler's, um, the background check study, we've got to fix that. That has got to be, um, it, it, is, it is such a huge problem. And it's such a, it's keeping good people uh, from getting into these fields. And it's been, particularly in my district, it has been at times a complete farce. When a company shows up and sets up in a hotel room every other week, how do, you know, if you're going for a job and you want to take, go, I'm going to, you got to go to a hotel room in the Marriott to get your fingerprints done, 
No, there's nothing sketchy about that, right? So, so, so this this really needs to get fixed. And so, uh, I whatever we can do going forward on that, um, I, I think we've got to get there. So, I, I appreciate again all the work. This is a, it's, a, it's a heavy lift, and and thanks for everybody who's chipped in. And thank you also, Senator Mann, Senator Bolden. Uh, Senator Morrison, too, for for your insights on on some of the work that I did. You were you were invaluable to me. So thanks. Thank you, Senator. Senator Wicklin, any closing thoughts? Well, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and I I really appreciate all of the discussion tonight. I appreciate the the topics that we covered tonight, and I appreciate all of your efforts over this session. I feel like we've um, examined and been able to take action on a lot of important areas, um, despite the fact that we don't have uh, a huge budget target to, to go after, uh, to fulfill this year. Um, and um, as you mentioned, Senator Kupak, I would also like to extend my thanks to the staff. Um, thank you, Mr. Hadala and Ms. Uh, hoffman Lati, Mr. Albrecht, uh, Mr. Monaghan. Uh, we couldn't it, it's amazing how much um, work this is for staff. So um, I really appreciate that. And um, I think to your point, Senator Atke, I mean, I think there are um, concerns about some of the proposals we're bringing forward, but I also think that we have the ability to shape um, our direction in more than one way, and we can move forward with uh, authorizing work on a public option that can help uh, people who are in the individual market with coverage that they can't use and can't afford. Um, and we can also say that we have to address um, Medicaid and public program rates in Minnesota. We, we absolutely have to um, address that, and it's going to be a very huge um, lift to be able to do that. So uh, that work needs to happen alongside um, addressing the, the population that is using the individual market today. So. Um, I also am excited about a lot of the other provisions that we were able to include in the bill, and thank you all for bringing bills forward that um, that we've been able to take and um, include and and move forward and take action for Minnesota um, for Minnesotans this year. So, thank you all for the work, and um, I would. I guess at this point, I'd like to make the motion to re um, recommend that Senate File 4699, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Finance. Uh, so uh, the motion is that uh, Senate File uh, 4699, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Finance and staff be instructed to make all the necessary technical corrections and conforming changes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. The motion passes and the bill is passed. And uh, <laughs> I'll never get that right. And we are adjourned. <laughs>